you so much for coming out. My name is Jarrett Weisselman. I work for BuzzFeed. And like this amazingly packed room, I love Unreal. I think it is far and away one of the best shows on television right now. Something that the American Film Institute, the Critics' Choice, and the Peabody Awards have all agreed on. Uh, as you can see, the second season is holding nothing back. So let's dig in and bring up the cast and crew of this amazing show. First, we have creator Sarah Gertrude Shapiro. Wherever you decide, you are the controller of this situation. Uh, we have executive producer Stacy Rukeyser. We have star Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. And last but not least, star Genevieve Buckner. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here today. These are not beers, um, but they could be. Uh, you know, this is something that's very interesting uh, that I think a lot of people here can relate to. When a show comes along in its first season and catches you off guard and is this brilliant, layered, challenging show like the first season of Unreal was, I think you look forward to season two with so much anticipation and like a little bit of dread because you're like, what if it's not as good? And obviously that is not happening here. I think as everyone in this room can attest to has seen the first two episodes of season two. Uh, but Sarah, I'm curious. I mean, when you have season one unleashed upon the world and you get ready to go back and dig into season two, I mean, do you also feel that sense of like, the fan expectation for a new batch of episodes? Um, I actually have come up with a really stupid analogy that I have no right to have, because I don't know anything about sports. Um, but LeBron James is the only person I've ever met. I worked with him on a campaign. And I keep going, I'm just LeBron, man. I'm just LeBron, like ball hoop, ball hoop. Like, I, I don't even really know what that means. Um, but um, I really just tried to ignore the hype as much as possible, because I feel like the way that the first season was made was very much like, you know, a lot of it was, you know, Marty and I talking, but also me in my apartment by myself. And so I really just tried to, in between seasons, go and do the same thing. And there's a cabin I go to. I don't know. I just, I, um, I definitely have seen in shows that I love that there can be, um, there can be a challenge in second seasons where you start playing to the cheap seats mm -hmm. and trying to imitate stuff that got you a pat on the head the first time. So I tried to put it completely out of my mind, stay inside the characters, and just do what they wanted to do, which was, you know, like there's just so much going on for Rachel and Quinn both and everyone around them. There was just so much story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just try to ignore the hype and be LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I will call you LeBron for the yeah. rest. Okay, good, because I feel really good about that. Um, but I'm curious, I mean, when you talk about that, what yeah. did you want to talk about and tackle in season two? Um, I think the thing for me is like, you know, at the end of season one, Rachel was at the bottom of a pit and there was no reason for her to stay at this job. I mean, she had basically almost run away with Prince Charming and gotten the brass ring and Quinn's, Quinn's cock blocked her and it was crazy and there was no reason for her to stay. So the thing for me was figuring out like what would justify her staying and she needed to feel like her life meant something. And that coupled with the fact I had always been sort of interested in doing a black suitor it like weirdly fell in lockstep with itself because um, that was like her terrible self-congratulatory way of being like, I'm making history. And it's also kind of like manic and it's super offensive. So it was just like all of these terrible, hip like hypocritical things for Rachel to do. And then I think also like so something that Stacey and I have talked about a lot in the writer's room this year is that mentorship is really complicated because if it works, you outgrow your mentor, which like there's no plan for that. Like there's no plan for the day where you're like, cool, thanks a lot, we gotta go. And so um, I think that we're so obsessed with women at work and women's relationships at work that this was like a great place to work from within and just literally getting inside of their bodies and thinking about what they want like Rachel is just she has to make her life mean something because her life fucking sucks <laughs> so that was like you know like her, her striving for that and so again like it's just the story comes from those characters it's not and I think and definitely ignoring like whatever I just try not to pay attention to yeah. whatever people are responding to and the stalkers who scream at me about Adam. I don't know who those people are, but <laughs> I have some stalker on Twitter who's like, I'm a, God damn it, you lied to your fans. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, if you just answered me, you would just really solve all your problems. <laughs> yeah. Just write back. Just, just let me know what's up. I'm just asking. Just, yeah, just, just tell me where you are physically right now. <laughs> um, Stacey, you wrote the episode that we just saw, oh. correct? Uh, phenomenal episode. Really incredible. Yeah. 
And I think, you know, uh, uh, the, the thing about a first episode or a pilot, you know, there's a lot of teeing up that has to happen. And so in episode two, we start to see a lot of those things come into play. What excited you about this episode in particular and getting the opportunity to write it? Yeah, well, it's interesting this season, um, too, because episode one was a little bit different because it wasn't fully the first night of Everlasting in the way that the pilot was. And so it was different, and we had a lot of discussions about yeah, that. Yeah, we had a couple. <laughs> um, and, and whether the fans could sort of deal with breaking form like that, you know, and to see where everybody was. And so in some ways... Uh, episode two is more like episode one of last year because it's the first night of Everlasting and you get to meet all of these girls. And it was actually so great to watch it tonight because I had sort of forgotten about that. I mean, we're shooting episode 10 right now. We're, we're editing episode eight. And it was sort of like, oh, this is when we met Ruby. And we, and, or really, you know, we'd met her in one, but we sort of see her in yeah. this world for the first time and seeing Tiffany for the first time. And, you know, that, that part's really exciting. But as we always talk about, it's Quinn and Rachel. It's their relationships that's the center of the show. And we are obsessed about talking about women at work. I mean, we're women who work. We don't think that that's um, an unusual thing to be incredibly ambitious or driven or want something for yourself. And yet it's not portrayed on television very often. And so what is it like to sort of make a deal with yourself? Like, I will stay with this person because... I'm getting a promotion and I'm getting a black suitor and those things, and then at least to have the promotion taken away from you. And, um, and then what does that look like? And then she makes this baller move at the end that really goes awry. So that's just so fun to find out what the heck is gonna happen with that new guy. You know? <laughs> Do you want to tell us what's going to happen with that? No. Because <laughs> we will no. listen. Okay. Um, but I do want to, you know, what I did think was very interesting was also the setting up of this Chet versus Quinn in a very new way we haven't seen before. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about sort of needing there to be organic reasons that Rachel say, did you also feel that this was a way to bring him back into the world that didn't feel so like, well, we want him on the show, so I guess we'll... He, um, he got in touch with me at the end of last season and he told me that he wanted to lose 50 pounds. And so I was like, cool, dude, I mean, you're of the age that you should do whatever you want to do to be healthy. I was like, we will, I was like, we will figure it out. And um, pretty quickly decided that he was going to become a men's rights activist and so started to having really, really weird text conversations with Craig Bierko about men's rights, which if you know Craig is like went down a a crazy K-hole. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were like emailing back and forth about weird retreats he could go on with like cr tribal leaders in like the Amazon. It just got really weird. But um, but through through all of that, like I think again, what I what I think is like we never want to fall asleep at the wheel, right? And like we're sort of a feminist show, but I also really wanted to talk about men and like what men are lacking in this day, in this day and age. <laughs> like not a feminist. I mean, what they want for themselves, not what they're lacking. But um, but what, like, because the men's rights activism thing, you know, like, going down that, that deep, dark hole on the internet is terrifying and horrible. But I, what I wanted to look at was what is the part of it that feels really relatable and authentic and real, which is that men don't really know how to be. It's like what Chad's talking about. They're like, I'm supposed to kill things with my bare hand and open a door and show up in a diamond-studded helicopter and not put the, you know, put the toilet seat down and just all these mixed messages. And I think what we're saying for all of our people is they're kind of lost and they don't know who to be. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, as soon as we stumbled on that, it felt like this great activation because he just came in like right at Quinn and Rachel. And the other thing is that Quinn and Rachel basically both fell for the princess fantasy last year. And they have always vowed we're not going to smoke the crack we sell. So we're not going to fall for that. You know what I mean? But like Rachel was literally about to run away with Prince Charming. And she fell for it and he dumped her. And so their tattoos that say money, dick, power are just saying we're going to live like men. Mm -hmm. And so what we thought was really fascinating is them deciding to be men and then Chet coming in and saying like I am the alpha male. And like what is going to happen with that? I feel like you are going to inspire people to get that tattoo, by the way. Like, I feel like it's, so if dangerous. someone in this theater doesn't so have dangerous. it already. I was saying, our, my, like, we love this moment. One of my favorite things that's happened is that somebody, like, two people showed up at, the, at an event we had in New York, and they were outside before the first episode had aired with the handmade money dick power tattoo shirts, and they wanted their tits signed. So we were, like, we were, like autographing their tits. It was great. Gladly did it. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Jeffrey, last year you and I talked a lot about how exciting it was for you to really be talking about the role, you know, people of color play in reality television, and it was something that you were really uh, keen to talk about, and you liked that you got to be sort of a vessel for that conversation. I mean, that said, I mean, season two must just be so much more exciting for you as you get to dig into those th themes on such a bigger scale. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, Sarah and I had endless conversations about it uh, prior to beginning season two. Um, we knew that this was a very uncomfortable discussion that we were about to have, that we were about to delve into, but it was better to tell the story than to not tell the story. Um, I feel like uh, Jay, playing a character like Jay, is a very rare thing. I don't feel like a lot of characters exist like him on television. Um, a you know producer, on, a, a producer of color on a reality television sh series who is good at his job, but just continues to live under this glass ceiling and the story of what that's like. Um, he sees the incredible inequalities that people of color experience in reality television behind the scenes and in front of the camera and how he has to, you know, uh, uh, walk in both worlds in order to get ahead. Um, uh, you know, in his heart of hearts, I think he wants to protect his contestants and protect Darius Beck and protect himself, but at the same time, he wants to get a promotion. He sees Rachel, who has been at ever, in the world of Everlasting uh, for the exact same amount of time as he has, and she just keeps rising in the ranks year after year after a year by doing these horribly manipulative and deceitful things and it doesn't sit right with him to uh, you know approach approach the job in the same way that her and Quinn do it he has to kind of find his own way so it's a very tricky ter territory to navigate and he's just you know it's this is his story of finding his way through that absolutely I loved the scene he had what you had with a uh, Ruby character in this episode where mm -hmm. you sort of sell Rachel out and there is that moment where you're sort of like I was just I, telling the truth I wasn't selling anybody out that is fair <laughs> I was giving her away for free but it's like <laughs> <laughs> but it is that great moment where you like he's doing it for good reasons, and then you're like, no, this is unreal, he's not doing it for good yeah. reasons, he's doing it for himself. I mean, what excites you about sort of treading that moral sort of tightrope in this, this year as well? What is it like for me? What is, I mean, what excites you about sort of continuing that? Um, it feels real. That's yeah. the thing is that, you know, I mean, when you're in your 20s, I mean, I'm 31, I'm assuming Jay is around the same age as me, but, you know, like when he's been at this job for a while, when you, um, when you have to pay your rent and you have to pay your bills and this is your job and you've been doing it for a few years, like, and you've, you're already this deep into it, it's like, I have to keep going. Um, Sarah and I were discussing it that, like, you know, what are his reasons for being there? Does he feel like, like, like that promotion is just around the corner coming any day now. You kind of like keep your fingers crossed every day going into work, hoping that you will get there. Um, that today is the day, and you know, and then at the end of the day, today wasn't your day, but you just keep on getting. You get up the next morning, you come back to work. Um, you know, it feels it feels very real. I know what it was like to be in my twenties working as an actor, taking jobs that didn't necessarily mean that much to me, or I wasn't very passionate about, or that I didn't even really like at the end of the day, but doing it because I needed to pay my bills, right? right. Um, you know, how far are you willing to go, and how much is the how much can are you going to sell your soul for? At the end of the day, it's the price of a paycheck. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, Genevieve, I'm gonna have some, I'm gonna be honest. I was not a huge Madison fan in season one. It was not, nothing to do with anything other than she was maybe hurting people that I fictionally love. <laughs> That's fair, I think a lot of However, people that way. However, that has beyond changed in the first episode of season two when you delivered what I believe will be one of the single best performances of the entire year. That <laughs> scene, I am 100% serious. That scene where Rachel is in your earpiece and it, I think I forgot to breathe for like the duration of that scene. When you get that pilot script, I mean the first, the season premiere script and you see that, what is the reaction like? I was so surprised, I had no idea what was in store for Madison in season two. I, I knew I was coming back and that was it and I didn't know what it was gonna be. And when I read that I was like, oh my goodness, okay, this is gonna be a very different season for Madison. It is not gonna be the same, like deer in the headlights the whole time, you know, spazzy little girl who doesn't know what she's doing. She, she still, still doesn't, doesn't know, know what she's, she's doing. doing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> I mean, she still doesn't, but it, it's, she's, she's trying a little harder. Um, but that was actually the first scene that I did for all of season two. That was my first day on set. That was the first scene I did, and I was like, well, okay, we're just getting right to it. Um, but I think, I think she's just, she's, she's really, you know, working towards her weird dream of becoming this, like, manipulative, you know, producer who can <laughs> run the world in her eyes, you know? That's, like, what she wants more than anything, and she sees Quinn as, like, the goddess, mm -hmm. and Rachel is the queen, and she just wants that, and she idolizes their ability to manipulate people into doing, you know, what they want without saying what they want, and it's a pretty impressive skill. It's a scary skill, but it's impressive. Yeah, absolutely, and I will say, as in my, you know, marveling in that moment, when she, after she threw up and she turned around, she goes, that was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I, again, I did not see that coming no. at all. 
I, did, I didn't know where that scene was yeah. going to go yeah. either when I was, as I was reading it. I mean, these scripts are, are so fun to read. Um, every time I get a new one, I'm like, yeah, let's go. What's going to happen? I have no idea where it's going to go, and it's always such an exciting trip. I love it. It's so good. Uh, Sarah, for you, I mean, in having Madison really just drink the Kool-Aid in that moment and be like, that was the best feeling I've ever had in my entire life. I want it again. I mean, why was that such a great step for that character and for coming in this year? Yeah, it's funny. When Sherry first talked to me about that scene, she called me and she was like, okay, so what is the scene? And I was like, you're a child molester and she's a child. <laughs> and was, she, was like, <laughs> she was like, that is so fucking dark. And I was like, I know, just do it. Just play it. And so there's a moment where she's like, good, Madison. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. um, but I have to say that um, I have to say that that is a really creepy thing for me to say. Um, but when, you know, like in the very early versions of Madison, like she was sort of in the first pitch when I pitched the show. She was in an early outline. And I think I wrote her like a golden retriever, like bumping into walls. Like she was like, whoa, whoa. You know, she was like a cartoon. And it really is a credit to her that like she did so much more with the character than I think we could have anticipated and it's become really, really fun to write for her. Um, but I think the idea of like, you know, abuse and molestation and grooming people really is sort of how we think about this world. Like it really is very creepy and very abusive. And I think that um, that they need to have an unending supply of people to come up the supply chain to replace them. As Rachel becomes Quinn, somebody needs to become Rachel, and Madison happens to be sitting there. And I think also there's something really dark in Rachel getting off on darkening this person's soul, just kind of eating her soul in front of her, like just being like, I'm eating your heart, like you are dead. You know, I think it's like, anyways, yeah, I'm not, we're not so dark at all. But yeah, so that's, but yeah, so I think it's, I think it's really important to show Rachel, as her soul is dying, wants to see somebody else die. And looking at it for Madison, I mean, I think it's true for both Madison and, yeah. and Jay this season. When we talk about ambition and getting ahead at work and, and how does that work, what is it that you have to do? I mean, I know I personally have seen at work people do things that are really dark and bad, and I admire it on some level. You are so weird that way. <laughs> I know. Because because is always like, that was amazing. I, I think you're the, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But I do think that it's 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 throughout the show we talk about you know people sort of figuring out how to be and how to get ahead and for Jay you know he has an opportunity with the black suitor but also it would really mean something for him to win for him to finally go all the way as it were and would that be the way to get ahead with Rachel and so you know where should he abandon his you know um, loyalty to Ruby or to a black suitor or to his morals in order to win or is it is he going to take a stand and it's the same thing for Madison obviously she would like blow her boss to get ahead and now she sees Quinn and Rachel and, and those are the queens as she says and so this is what it takes to do that and it, it, there is a rush of that and I think that we look a lot at sort of what happens when you do go after that and then you start to realize this is maybe not the best road for me but Madison's not going to realize that ever not for maybe. a little while <laughs> she's a, <laughs> no, she's a she's ding -a -ling. insane <laughs> Does do the pigtail stay? I feel like they'll be like that episode where it's like, now I'm the boss, and they all come Rachel. out. Rachel. <laughs> She's going to start single white femaleing her yeah. slowly throughout the season. Um, Jeffrey, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the first season of the show was so well received and people loved it. And I know sort of as a function of it, you've recently had a really cool honor uh, bestowed upon you. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, just recently AOL released the article yesterday that um, the Brahmin Garcia Braun casting director studio and acting studio have um, started a scholarship, the Jeffrey Boyer Chapman Scholarship in my name, um, uh, specifically for young LGBTQ identifying actors of color. Um, I work as, or I, I'm a speaker for the Human Rights Campaign and uh, the casting Yes, director. that's right. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, uh, I mean, I really owe it to them. I think they're just such a phenomenal, phenomenal casting studio. They do um, Masters of Sex and Gilmore Girls. They did Roseanne back in the day, so they you know, cast like really quirky but interesting and important television. Um, and they also have an acting an acting studio there. So they're just they're a space um, that has always been uh, you know uh, advocates of um, of uh, uh, being inclusive and um, supporting and nurturing young talent, um, specifically 
you know, just being, being a safe space for young LGBTQ identifying kids to um, come and really shine authentically as who they are. I feel like for so long in this, in this industry, as I spoke to before, when, you know, in, when I was in my 20s working as an actor and I was playing roles that just didn't really mean that much to me, um, a lot of them were straight roles. And it's not that I didn't like playing straight roles, I just felt like very stifled, like I wasn't able to truly be who I was in my, in my, you know, my life outside of set. Um, it took a long time for me to get to a point where I could um, stand up strong for who I am and say this, this is who I am, I'm not going to apologize for it. I want to play gay characters. I feel like these are very important stories to tell. I feel like it's important to normalize what it is to be a, a, a gay person in 2016 and to tell our stories authentically, to not stereotype and to not you know, um, you know, make us caricatures. Um, so being on Unreal really was was the catalyst for it. I don't know if a lot of you know, but we shot the original pilot for Unreal in, in Atlanta in 2013, and when I originally booked the role, um, Jay was straight, and I played the role, and we shot the pilot, and then once the show got picked up, um, I got a call from Sarah and Marty Knoxon, the creators of the show, saying, you're coming back, you're a series regular, and we want to write the character of Jay as gay. We want to write him after you. And I can't, I mean, I'm gonna start crying right now. That was, the big, that was, the, that was, that was one of my, you know, the most uh, special moments of my life, and one of the most incredible dreams come true I've ever experienced um, to be seen and to be valued for who I am, to not have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a really special thing, you know. I mean, as you can see, I'm like, I'm so touched by even just thinking about it right now. I'm so touched by it. So to to be in this position now, where I have this platform to speak my truth and to be able to share that with, you know, with 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 young LGBTQ identifying uh, people all across America and all across the world. I mean, that's just that's it's my dream come true. And um, you know, uh, it's 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 important. It's important to be able to to, to tell people during their formative years not to apologize for who they are, not to play small. Um, you know, just to shine as authentically as they possibly can because that is what's going to make the world a better place at the end of the day, so. Absolutely. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Unreal. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about, you know, the idea of coming back for a second season because you had all of these episodes to get to know your actor's strengths who would be returning and you could play to them. You sort of kind of, you know, learn how to write to them. I mean, when you think about how the characters were evolving. Like, what were you excited to write to with the actors who were coming back for season two? Um, well, I think, you know, like, Quinn is really just such an anomaly because, um, you know, Constance was my first choice when I pitched the show. She's who I always wanted for Quinn, but we couldn't get her forever and ever. She turned us down like 16 times. <laughs> um, so we actually, in the, in the pilot that we shot that uh, Jeffrey was talking about, we actually had somebody else playing Quinn, so I've seen what that is like, and um, I don't ever want to go back there. And um, no I haven't even seen it. They won't even show me the pilot. Yeah, no offense, <laughs> no offense to the actors. It was just not the right thing. It's such a hard role to nail, and I think that um, just knowing how incredible Constance is. I mean, we can take her anywhere. Like, anything can come out of her mouth, which is really liberating. Um, like, really anything. We haven't found a line yet. And with Rachel, I, I think it was that she can do so much. Sherry can do so much with her face, mm -hmm. and she can do so much with looks, that I think we wrote a lot that way in the first season, but we just felt confident to keep doing it this time. We can really put stuff sort of in action lines in the script and know that she's going to play it, yeah. which is super helpful. And then the thing that was kind of interesting, too, is that, like, um, you know, when I pitched the show, I had said, oh, yeah, and, like, the, you know, the show within the show renews every year, and um, the network exec I pitched to was like, that's amazing, fantastic, and I was like, buy my show, yes, it's great, and then um, we had the fun opportunity to realize, holy shit, what did we do, like, we have to create a new show every year, <laughs> like, we have to, like, it's so much work, like, we have to come up with new characters every year, which is super fun, and it's really challenging as a writer, but it is a whole lot of work, so that was having the joy of writing for people and actors that we knew, and then also creating a bunch of brand new people yeah. and finding them. Absolutely. What about for you, Stacey? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always say that when we were in the writer's room for season one, I never felt like we were doing something revolutionary. You know, I, I read the, the pilot script that Marty and Sarah had written, and I thought these were great characters. I was so sort of inspired by Rachel's inner conflict. and um, But then beyond that, I never thought, wow, it's too female protagonists and their anti-heroines, like I just didn't think in those terms. To me, they were complicated, fucked up women, and I'm a complicated, fucked up woman, and everybody I know is a complicated, fucked up woman, and so it just felt real, you know, and it felt like writing for those characters, and I knew we were taking big swings in terms of the story. Um, it was fun to be able to go for it in that way. It was fun to say, Mary jumps, in episode six and she dies, you know, and I remember how exciting that was in the moment 
that we knew it wasn't the season finale, it, it wasn't the end, it was, we were just gonna go for it. And that was really fun. So I knew we were doing that and it was fun and frankly it felt soapy in that way. And so to have the critical response that we had and the audience response was overwhelming because I realized it is revolutionary. I mean, I never thought about it, that you don't see shows with two female protagonists that are quote unquote unlikable in, in this way. Um, and that was um, a real kind of wake up call to say like this really does matter to people and, and this is really special. And so that's just so exciting to get to continue to do that because we still have as much fun in the writer's room just taking those big swings and stuff, but um, you feel very inspired to take it to the next level too. Absolutely. I would love to open it up to all of your questions now. Um, I don't know how we're going to do that. So maybe we're just going to maybe just raise your hand and use, oh, there's a microphone. Guys, there's a microphone right over here if you would like to ask a question. There we go. There. I know, so far. You know what? Why don't you ask your question and I will, yes, and I will repeat it into the microphone while we sort that out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Sorry, it's recorded. Oh, no, that's okay. Don't be shy, guys. They don't bite. We're not very shy, so you guys yeah. may be shy. It's fine. Maybe we'll just do, if anyone can raise a hand, and if it's easier than getting up and walking to the microphone. Oh, look, look at, at that. this brave look soul. Brave, brave. Go, 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 Embracing go, go. her inner, yes. I love it. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi. What's your name? My name's Kenda. Hi, Kenda. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, I was the showrunner of the show Teen Mom for the first four seasons. Hello. So. Here we go. I'm yeah. excited. <laughs> um, so thank you for the shout out last week. No problem. That's no awesome. problem. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually now trying to become a TV writer, but that's another story. But I wondered if you guys ever have conversations in the writer's room about, um, like, I don't find any of the characters unlikable at all. I find them to be ambitious, complicated, fascinating, respectable women who are trying to do something. Yes, um, <laughs> but do you ever have conversations about, are people going to see equate ambition with unlikableness in your show? Well, we don't have those conversations because we don't think ambition means that you're unlikable. I mean, I will say that there were a lot of conversations from the beginning about understanding Rachel. And one of the things, um, you know, a great mentor, Glenn Mazzara of mine, said to me once is that when people say unlikable about women, characters, the way to fix that is to give them vulnerability. <laughs> And, um, and I think that that's really true, and that was built in with these characters anyway, you know? And I think that we always say that Quinn and Rachel have giant hearts, giant. And so it was a question of seeing that, and just to give you a specific example, you know, in the first season, episode three is when she goes home to see her mom. And so in classic kind of TV terms, that's breaking format. You know, she leaves the show, she leaves Everlasting, and we go home with her mom. And so we had a lot of conversations about whether that should be in episode three or if we should wait and do that in episode eight until the audience is kind of used to what you're doing. That's like the traditional way of thinking about it. And, um, you know, ultimately we decided it really should stay in episode three so that you get a window into Rachel a little bit more and understand um, what what is going on inside and what she's fighting against and what this sort of self, um, you know, idea of herself, where that comes from. So, yeah. And we kind of put a ban on the word likability, like very early on. Marty and I were like, we're not taking that note. That's not a note that we respond to. So that was, um, but the other thing I think in casting, in casting it was really important because this character was actually, um, came from a short film that I wrote and directed um, with a really incredible actress who nailed it, um, but she wasn't available for the part, and so we were casting, and I was really kind of heartbroken because I just couldn't get over it. Like, I had just, I had found the character with this person, and I just wanted her, and when Shiri walked in, um, she started talking to me, and she was asking me something, and I was like, I'm sorry, what did you say? And she was like, oh, I'm doing the lines. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, I had heard them 60 times. I had written them, and I, and it was so natural to her and then there was also so much kindness in Shiri. And I think that what Stacey is saying is it's kind of built in because in the casting of Rachel, Shiri as a person is such an incredibly good person. And I feel like you just feel that ache in her. And so I really do feel like with her, we've been able to get away with stuff that it would have been harder with a different casting decision. Yeah. Thank you. 
I am freezing watching the show. Can you tell us some stories about the weather situation up in Vancouver? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was it was a it, it was a wild wild situation. Uh, I mean, we Vancouver rains a lot, as I'm sure you all know. It's like a rainforest up there. We started in March shooting this season, and it was just like Canada right in the middle of cold. it. Canada <laughs> is cold. It doesn't really snow in Vancouver, but it does rain there a lot. And we were in the middle of night shoots for the for the almost the entirety of the first two episodes. So it was like from like 4 p.m. to like 6 a.m. shooting. I think Genevieve and I were fine because we're like we, we're all bundled we up in our clothes with the girls. Yeah. 32 degrees bikinis. It was crazy. Yeah, it was 32 yeah. degrees. We were. They were was, all yeah. strong troopers. I'm Way glad they kept those they elements of it though. Like you can see our breath, and you can, if you pay close attention, you can see like the girls' noses are red, and the, you know, and the, their lips are shivering a little bit. But they were just such amazing troopers. I mean, I think it, it added a, a, it was like a, it was like another character added to the story. I it's mean, we got to comment on it, and that was the reality of it. That this whole entire situation of shooting everlasting in this weather in this situation was not how it was supposed to be. So we just kind of added that yeah, into the story. Yeah, it's very very realistic because you can't control the weather, and if you're shooting something, it. It doesn't change for you. You need to get the shot. So, <laughs> yeah. If it's raining, you do the show anyway. Yeah. yeah. And I think you know, for us from the very beginning, it was important to show all of the cracks and seams and gross, dirty bits of this world. Mm -hmm. And so um, we always sort of talk about the mole people who live in the walls and the beautiful butterfly people who live under the lamps, and the mole people come out and eat the butterflies. That's sort of our like. The even, producers and the mole people. Yeah, the producers are the mole people that live in their weird cave. Um, <laughs> But even in the designing of the color palette of the show, that's very intentional that like the producers are always in monotones and grays and browns and the contestants are in jewel tones. But so part of that is like that transition between those worlds where you see the girls sort of under the lights, but then in parkas, and they're kind of like falling into the mole people world, but they're like back into the lights. So I think when we get into situations like that with the rain, our, our effort is usually just to embrace it and to try to make it part of the story. And it, I mean, it does work because it shows yeah. how far they're willing to go. Yes. You know, they're like, I will stand in this Confederate bikini in yes. the rain in 32 degrees for yes. this gentleman. Yes, and the show must go on. And I think that the show must go on is just such a big thing for Quinn and Rachel. And there's something in the first episode that I realized we never really explained. But for them, you know, like producer, hello, um, pushing a day, which means that you stop shooting and shoot the next day. Is, can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's on their head. So these women are under extreme financial pressure. They are responsible to the network to deliver a show on time and on budget, and that never changes. So like they have to get it done, and that is such a big drive for them as characters that I think it's really interesting to see them have to work through that. So the rain was real. It was real. It was not pleasant, <laughs> but it it looks good. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm a TV super fan, that's obviously why we're all here, and I love a prestige drama, but like your DVR fills up with them, and sometimes it just becomes like work, like Oscar season watching all the shows, and it's just exhausting. And, and one of the things that's great about Unreal is that it has all of that credibility, and it's absolutely a prestige drama, but it still has this kind of like soapy propulsiveness that makes it so fun to watch, and so easy to recommend to my friends, and then they all binge it. And so I was just wondering to hear a little bit, like, does the subject matter do all of that work for you, or how do you strike that balance? And has there been a time where you've been like, oh, crap, that's too soapy. I've got to tone it back. It just writes itself. Yeah, well, it's super easy. <laughs> Stacy and I, Stacey and I spend most of the time at the spa. I don't even, yeah. <laughs> We don't work very much. I mean, I, I will say, first of all, thank you for that. That's a huge compliment, so thank you. I mean, I think that it is built in. I mean, listen, when Sarah experienced this as a person, I mean, Sarah is a big thinker. Um, and so she had a lot of thoughts about this, but she also was aware that she was living in the cupcake world, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, we, we, we do try to do both, you know? I mean, we have big thoughts, we're all, you know, smart lady thinkers and man thinkers and we have um, a couple token men yeah. um but it's also really fun t for us to do the sort of you know the soapier stories i mean i think you kind of have to in today's landscape i think that audiences are impatient for story and get excited to um have things pushed along but it's also really fun to write you know yeah. it's fun to sort of it is, go through it and it's fun to break too i think yeah. in the room like sometimes i get like manic where i'm like laughing so hard i have to walk out and it's like, ooh, okay, come back in. It's, but you know, it's like there's there's stories there's stories to break on this show that are just like we can't even stop like outdoing each other because it's so hilarious. I mean, there's something coming up in episode nine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <it's so exciting. laughs> yeah. But anyways, it's fun I'm really to excited. be allowed to do that. Yeah. I mean, I do think also that the studio and the network are really supportive of us, yeah. you know, and 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 
no, they did. They never actually gave the note of like, for example, Mary cannot jump off the roof, or she yeah. can't be dead, or something like that. In episode six, they really have encouraged us to go for it, and they're excited by it when we do a season long pitch too. So that has been incredible, yeah. incredible to have that support. And I think having been a producer on The Bachelor too, there's like a weird switch that goes off in my head where I'm like, and then I'm like, none the dress, none the bitch, and then blah blah blah, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's just like what we have to do. But so I mean, there's so much more to it than that because we're seeing the full reality of these girls instead of the bachelor version of these girls but there is there are certain hallmarks of that show that make make it easy to pinpoint some of that stuff it's funny i've seen this maybe more than anything else like on social media but i've seen so many people who say watching unreal makes them watch the bachelor differently now it's like fundamentally changed everything about how people engage with that show it's incredible hi hi um you got, you mentioned mary jumping a couple times and i was wondering are we going to see shia again because i love I loved her. There's someone who looked like me on TV and was really happy. <laughs> Aww, that's beautiful. Shia, so Shia is amazing. That actress is incredible. And that was like one of the heart, you know, heartbreakers for me. Um, in, it was having to tell her that we were going to do something else this season. And it literally was just because we thought Rachel needed uh, a new love interest more than a nemesis. And it's like one of those story decisions we made for literally no other reason except story. And she was great, but we kind of felt like her storyline was done. She was always intended to be a one-season character, so okay. yeah, but we loved her. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, we're coming towards the end of our panel, but before we do, you know, I want to ask each of you, uh, we've seen two episodes from season two. There's obviously, we're just, those things are still being teed up. So when you look at the season, and I'm going to ask each of you, and Genevieve, I'll start with you, um, and you can speak to your character. I mean, what are you excited for the audience to experience with Madison this season? Well, I mean, I think you guys have seen, like, the very beginnings of it in episode one. It is just this weird transformation from you know, oddball who's kind of out of place to, I mean, she was really like thrust into <laughs> producer. <laughs> and it's gonna be challenging for her, but at the same time, it's what she wants more than anything. So I think that transition is very fascinating. And I do feel bad for the other characters, like Jay, it, it really sucks for him. He's been doing it for how long? And then all of a sudden this little twerp is sitting next to him. Like Sarah said that a few times, it's very true. It's like, that must suck to see for him but she's just all smiles about it. She's fine with it, which is a little messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, what about you? What are you excited for everyone to experience with Jay this year? Um, Jay really goes on a journey this year, and I think it's really been such a fun exploration, um, you know, playing a, um, a, a gay producer of color in this world where he is really the only one who exists, who's, like, who, you know, who, a, a, a gay man of color working as a producer. He really has no allies. He really has no one to, who has his back. He really has no one who he can, you know, like, uh, cry on their shoulder. Um, you know, he, uh, it's, it really is every man and woman, every woman for themselves this year, but there's still that sense of camaraderie when it comes to Quinn and Rachel and Madison, the girls, and Jeremy and Chet, the guys, but Jay is this gay person, like, where does he fit? Um, why is he there? How far is he willing to go? We get to explore that this season. They really, I think I'm so grateful for the writers this season for creating this, like, really beautiful, three-dimensional human being out of Jay this season, so you guys are, you guys will see, see what we have in store. I love it. Ariel! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you! It's not Ariel. That's Ariel Kevill. She, she played Brittany, Brittany in season one. That's yes. Brittany season one. Yes, Ariel. Yeah. Brittany season one. Brittany's Love back, you. bitch. The bitch came back. Uh, <laughs> Stacy, what about you? What are you excited for? Uh, what I'm excited is to see is, you know, as, um, as, Sarah said, you know, they decided that money, dick, power is the way to go. Rachel and Quinn decided money, dick, power is the way to go this season, and we're going to be men. And we're not going to fall for the princess fantasy like we did last season. And I think that that is an interesting choice. And for you to see, how well does that work? And how well does that work out? Sarah? Everything. <laughs> I'm super excited about the season. I just can't. I'm like... It just feels like it was electrified, you know what I mean? Like, we really did have permission to just go so hard and go balls to the walls, and there was, like, almost nothing holding us back. So I'm pretty excited about all of it. The ending is, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> I love that. Well, listen, as Ariel said, the show has been picked up for a third season, which is very, very exciting. <laughs> but that should be no reason for you guys to become complacent fans. Don't forget to tweet about the show, recommend the show to your friends. The more viewers, the better, because there needs to be, like, at least 25 seasons. You guys good with that? <laughs> You on board? Sarah's passing. That makes me tired. Amazing. <laughs> guys, give it up for the cast Thank and crew of Unreal. Thank you so much for coming out. Everyone enjoy the rest of your festival. <laughs>